As Zach mentioned, it's hard to wait sometimes, isn't it? As we look around our world, even the different things in our lives, it's very easy to get distracted. It's hard to wait. And we sing, even so come, even so come, Lord Jesus. That's the perspective that we need. We need a perspective of Christ. We need to see our risen Savior. To help us do that, this summer we're going to have a short series in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. So if you're not there already, please turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 8. It's the word of the Apostle John. The last book in your Bible, the last book that was written to God's people. The word of God says... The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants, the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's look to our Lord before we look to his word. Lord Jesus, in your word, you say, behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. You say that you're, you're coming quickly, and yet we confess that so often we live as if you will never come back, or as if the, your return is very far away. We come before you and ask for forgiveness. Forgive us for becoming too comfortable in this world, for becoming too attached to worldly things, even becoming too attached to to good things of this life. Forgive us for taking our eyes off of you. By your grace, give us a greater longing for you. Give us a greater anticipation and expectation of your soon return. In your word, you tell us that that hope, that hope of your return, that hope of seeing you will purify us even as you are pure. And so we ask you, purify us, cleanse us from lesser loves so that we will love you above all things. Use your word in these moments that we have to shake us out of our complacency, to shake us out of our lethargy so that we can love you above all things. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Will Jesus really come back? What difference does Christ's return make? The apostle Peter, and he declares in Scripture in the last days, one of the indicators of the last days, that mockers will come. They will ridicule. They will say that the the Lord Jesus will, will never come back. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 4, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning. So it's not new in our day and age, in every age. People have 
questioned the return of Christ. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, you know it's written at the end of the first century, and and believers were experiencing persecution, deep persecution. Christ's death and resurrection had not ushered in a a time or a kingdom of, of earthly victory. Instead, the opposite seemed to have happened. Believers were being persecuted. Their possessions were being confiscated. They were being imprisoned, abused, scattered, and even martyred and killed because they were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was going on? Had Christ forgotten his people? Would he ever return? For the last 2,000 years, believers of every generation have been asking those same questions. The reality of Christ's second coming should have a deep and lasting impact on each of our lives. The fact that our Lord and Savior will return should in many ways be an overarching theme of our lives. When we're consumed with our day-to-day lives and we have little, it's because we have little consideration of Christ's second coming. And, and when we have little consideration of his second coming, we will tend to live for ourselves. We will tend to live for the here and now as if there's, there's nothing, there's no great coming of Christ that we are looking forward to. So the Apostle John, as he writes this book, he had a deep concern that believers in the first century would live fully for Christ. And yet the Apostle John, we know, was inspired by the Spirit of God. And he, this book is given not just for them in the first century, it's given for us in the 21st century. The Lord has a deep concern that we live in light of his second coming. So over the next two weeks, we're going to look at the first chapter here in Revelation chapter 1. And then for much of the summer, we're going to consider um, God's words to the seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3. Pointed messages that have deep application for each of us. But this morning, we're going to look at the first eight verses. And really, this is the introduction. This is the introduction to the book. The whole first chapter is the introduction. But as he begins here, we will see that, that John's main point here is that Christ's second coming should energize lives of adoration and obedience. Christ's second coming should energize in you a life of adoration and obedience. We will see first that that Christ is coming soon. And then we will look secondly that that Christ is coming in victory. And finally, we will see that Christ, when he returns in his second coming, he is coming in great glory. Let's look first of all at Christ is coming soon. Look there at verse 1 of Revelation chapter 1 again. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John. Notice at the very beginning, he makes it very clear, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first word in this book is revelation. It's an unveiling. It's an unveiling. But what is it? He says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This doesn't just mean that it's from Christ. Even more importantly, this means that it's a revelation about Jesus Christ. This book focuses on him. It reveals him. It unveils him. Many people read the book of Revelation and they lose sight of the central point of the book. And the central point of the book is a person. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And every vision and every description of Christ in this book is filled, filled with awe. It's filled with wonder. It's filled with with glory and, and majesty. No book of the Bible reveals more clearly the glory of God or the splendor of Jesus Christ. When Christ came the first time, he came very differently. He came in humiliation. He came in, 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 and suffered. And yet there will come a time, the book of Revelation declares, there will come a time when he returns very differently. And throughout God's word, we see this theme. There will, become, there will come a time when Christ will be exalted and all will bow before him in humiliation. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, For this reason also God highly exalted him. 
When Christ was resurrected from the dead, he was exalted and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We look around us today and it seems anything but that. But the book of Revelation is, it's an unveiling. It's an unveiling of how Christ will be exalted and how every knee will bow before him. And John says here in, that, in the middle of that, he says that these things must soon take place. Now when you read that, what's your question? Of course, your question is, well, well how? How can these things, when he says these things must take place soon, well, soon, this was written 2,000 years ago. It's been almost 2,000 years since the Apostle John wrote this. What is he talking about? These things are, are soon. Well, for one, this gives us a, a perspective on how God views time. God's uh, perspective on time is very different from our view of time. Because you know, we know that Scripture says with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and, and a thousand years is as one day. And so those 2,000 years are, are very insignificant in a sense in length of, of time. But this also conveys that that God's word declares that God's people always should live with an expectation of Christ's soon return. Christ said this when he was here the first time he came. In Luke chapter 12, we see him talk about this a lot. In verses 35 and 36, Christ says, Be dressed in readiness. Keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast, so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and knocks. Later on in that same chapter, Christ says in verse 40, you too, be ready. Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And so we see here that the Apostle John says it's soon. It's soon that Christians, believers, should be ready. We should live in anticipation of Christ's return. And so this looks ahead to the, to the second coming of Christ, the, the whole event of the second coming of Christ and all the different aspects that surround that. We don't know when it's going to happen. And so because of that, we should live in expectancy and we should live in anticipation. It should change the way we live. For every generation of church history, there has been the expectation, there's been the hope the hope that it could be us. It could be us. It could be us that are here at Christ's second coming. It will come in our generation. And so John continues there in verse one, and he he says, he, he says, and he sent and communicated it, he's talking about the book of Revelation, by his angel to his bondservant, John. We get a little window here into the inspiration of the book of Revelation. This wasn't John just deciding to write about some things. He very clearly says this is under the inspiration of God. The word angel is used 71 times in the book of Revelation, more than any other book of the Bible by far. Angels are in this book. They're also, though, involved in the transmission of this book. We know that the Old Testament law, that angels were involved in that. Particularly, this book says that angels were involved, an an angel was involved in that. God gave the word to his son who gave it to an angel who communicated it to John, the apostle. We'll see next week, obviously, that the Holy Spirit was behind all of that as he inspired this book. John is probably at least 80 or 90 years old here when he writes the book of Revelation. Look at verse 2. It says, Who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw? John is testifying. A great word here, martyreo. We get the word martyr from, but basically it's someone who testifies of something that they have seen, something that they have experienced. As you look forward to the book of Revelation, there are profound realities that that were revealed to John, things that he saw, and and he's going to record what he has seen. It's going to be challenging. John only has a certain word box, but John's going to need to describe a lot of things that are way outside of his word box. And it'll start, first of all, in his description of Christ. And John here declares that this is the word of God. 
What he is writing, what he is recording in the book of Revelation, this is the word of God. Now this isn't, John's not speaking about himself as if he's some special author. No, he's speaking about God is choosing to reveal his word through John's writing. Now you see that clearly in the next verse. Look at verse three, you can see the implication of that. If this is God's word, well, what does it say? Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. That's easy to read that, and commonly people say, well, yes, you're blessed if you read the book of Revelation and if you, if you apply the words of the prophecy. Now, that's true, but that's actually not what he's talking about here. You need to note, Scripture is inspired even down to the number or singular and plural, and it says, he who reads, singular, those who hear, plural. What's he talking about here? Talking about a situation very much like we're in right now. He's talking about a, a worship service. He who reads. They didn't all have their own copies of God's word, so how would they get God's word? Someone would have to read God's word. And then those who hear refers to the congregation. So John's expectation is this just isn't, it just isn't just any book. He expects that you read this. As he's writing this book to the seven churches, he said, you need to read this in your churches, in the corporate assembly, in the worship service, which tells you that he knew this was scripture and that it would be read and it would be applied. And the content, no doubt, would be exposited and explained so they would understand what is being writing, right, written like we're doing now. But he, he ends it with what? It's not enough just to hear it. It's not enough just to read it. It's not enough just to hear it. There needs to be an application. Like James says, blessed are those who are doers of the word to live in light of this. This book is not written just so that we'll have a theoretical understanding of various doctrines. This book is written so that we would apply it to our lives. And why? Look at the end again. He says it again. In case you didn't get what he just said, he said, for the time is near. He reminds you again. He reminds his readers again, the time is near. The nearness, the nearness of the Lord's coming is often in the New Testament given as a call for us to live lives that are focused on him. Since Christ's return is near, since Christ's return is right around the corner, it should motivate you to live and decisively, and to live fully for God. If you know that your boss is coming that morning, he's going to check out your work or, or whatever, you're going to be very different. If you're a teacher, if you're a student, if you know your teacher is coming and is going to check your work and see how you're doing, you will live very differently. So also for Christians, in a wonderful way, we should live in anticipation, not out of concern or worry, because we, but because we look forward to seeing our great Savior. So what are implications of this first section? Well, we need to live in light of Christ's soon return. Very simply, we need to live in light of Christ's soon return. Before this morning's corporate worship service, how often this past week did you actually think about and consider Christ's return, Christ's second coming? If we're honest, probably most of us would say not very often, if at all. And that's why this, ver this book is so essential for us to, to remind us. Although, although we would never join the mockers who deny Christ's coming, like Peter talks about, although we would never say, no, Christ isn't coming, how easy it is for us to get caught up in our daily lives and live now as if Christ is not coming we can be consumed with, with paying bills, with, with taking care of our responsibilities and keeping up our homes and, and getting things done in the here and now and easily forget Jesus is coming soon. Christ is coming soon. Better in a wonderful way would be a, a, a shadow that would overarch everything, an umbrella that would be over everything we do and consider. Remember when Christ told that parable of the unworthy servants? They live for self as if their master would never return. 
Well, John's words here are, are given to Christ's servants to, to kindle afresh in anticipation and expectation that Christ is coming and that we would long for that day so that we can see him, so that we can be with him and it would motivate us to live for his glory with joy and delight. First John 3 talks about how um, when we see him, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And then in verse three, it says, those who have this hope in them purifies them, even as he is pure. In other words, this is not a theoretical doctrine. This is a reality that if we understand, and if we are gripped to the depth of our souls, that Christ is coming soon that it will cause us to live differently, more purely. And that doesn't mean that we'll primarily keep the rules of the Bible better. It means that we'll live a life that's more pure in our love for him, and our longing for him, and our desire for him. But it starts with a passion for his return, his second coming. Because Christ's second coming should energize lives of adoration and obedience. So first we've seen Christ is coming soon. Let's look at secondly, how is Christ going to come? Christ is coming in victory. Look at verse four. John, the apostle John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, John indicates that the original audience of his letter were the seven churches of Asia, which were near to where he was exiled on the island of of Patmos. And whenever we look at a, a scripture, we always need to consider who was the original audience. Our understanding of how do we interpret God's word, it's authorial intent. What did the original author intend when he wrote that? It doesn't matter what it means to you because you didn't write it. What matters is what does it mean to the original author and then how does that apply to us? We see down in verse 11, those churches are named um, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And, And these were real historical churches. These weren't ages of church history. These were real historical churches. These are the earthly recipients of this letter. And John, he's writing to the seven most prominent churches, strategic churches in the region, and then from them, his word is going to to go on and continue to the outlying areas. And in the coming weeks, in chapter two and three, we will see, he actually gives, before he gets into the, the body of his letter, he's going to give a specific note to each one of those churches. Uh, appropriate encouragement, and for a number of them, very strong exhortations. And for, from what John writes to these churches, it's very obvious. They're being wooed by uh, complacency. They're being wooed toward compromise. Why? Because the threat was deep persecution. And so they're being wooed by compromise so that they wouldn't have to go through the deep persecution that Christians were experiencing at this time. And so he gives them a blessing at the very beginning there in the middle of verse four. He says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now you've seen this grace to you and peace in many other New Testament books. This isn't just a a throwaway greeting. This is from the God of the universe to the original uh, readers, but then to us. And when the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, when they promise grace and peace to you, they will deliver always, every time. You say, why was grace and peace so significant in this greeting? What's, what, are they, what are they in the midst of? And particularly as you read the rest of the book, what are they heading for? What is, the, what, what is, gonna, what is gonna come upon the earth? There is great catastrophe, great conflict, great difficulty. And they themselves are going through great difficulty. And so they needed that grace and peace. And, and notice who it's from. It's from him who was and who is and who is to come. Now what is that in a sense? That's an exposition of the divine name Yahweh. In Exodus chapter three, verses 14 and 15, where God says to Moses, what's my name? Well, he tells him it's it's, I am who I am. 
the great Yahweh. That uh, little phrase there, him who is and who was and who is to come, it's the same idea as that. What is that saying? That the Lord, God, Yahweh, he is Lord over all of history. He was Lord in the first century. He is Lord today. He is Lord when Christ returns. He is Lord, the self-existent one. He directs all the events of this world and humanity according to his sovereign plan for his glory and for the good of his people. Then at the end of verse four, he says, who else is this from? And I've already mentioned this. It says, and from the seven spirits who were before his throne. And what's the question that you have from that? Seven spirits? I thought there was one. Holy Spirit. Why does he talk about seven spirits here? Seven is the number of, of fullness. So really he's identifying the, the fullness of the person of the Holy Spirit. Many of your versions will have it capitalized. The original text isn't capitalized. It was written in all caps. But that's because the, uh, the um, translators are, are giving that idea which the context would indicate this is talking about the Spirit of God. And so when you have the other two members of the Trinity identified, this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity who's ministry is absolutely crucial to believers in the churches at that time to the believers of all time. And who else is it from? Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. Now, because the focus of the book of Revelation is on the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, John goes into more detail here. He explains more about the person and also the work of Christ. It's easy to think that things will only get darker and darker as, as believers struggle to stand firm against ungodliness and sin. And yet, what does John remind us? He reminds us and the first century believers that Christ himself is the supremely faithful witness. He knew that the people that he is writing to, what, what was their greatest need? Their greatest need was a clear view of Christ. He knows, the Spirit of God knows that our greatest need is a clear view of Christ. He also says that he's the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? It's a reference to Christ's resurrection. Now, Christ wasn't the first person to be resurrected, and yet firstborn is used here, emphasize the preeminence of Christ's resurrection. Why is Christ's resurrection so significant? particularly in a context, context where many believers were being killed for their faith. Why was Christ and is Christ's resurrection so important, so sweet? Because it is the fact that because Christ resurrected from the dead, we have nothing to fear. Not even the greatest thing that humans fear, death. Because Christ resurrected, we also will be resurrected to be with him. He also continues, he says, he's the rulers of the kings of the earth. Christ is the victorious conqueror. Christ is the establisher of the the kingdom of God. Why would this bring them great comfort? Because no matter how difficult the things that Christians face, the book of Revelation declares that Jesus Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in control of all things. And he will conclude his plan for this world as he always intended. And what does that point to? Why can all of these things be said about Christ? What is the foundation of all of this? It's the last phrase of verse five. And it's really the the central part, the central part of the theme of what Revelation is about. It says, to him who loved us, loves us. To him who loves us, and released us from our sins by his blood. Notice there that it says Christ loves us. It's a present tense. It's not a past tense. 
present tense, which means it's continual, continual loving of us. It's saying that he continues to love us with an internal, unending love. John is declaring to the first century believers that of overarching everything they're going through is the fact that Christ was loving them. So also for you, Christ loves you. How do you know that? How do you know that Christ loves you? He tells you right there in the text. How do you know? Because he released us from our sins by his blood. He loves us so much that he did that. Blood refers to death. Particularly, it refers to the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross, the atonement of Christ where he stood in in your place because of the sin that you had committed and would commit throughout your entire life. Christ took the penalty for all that sin upon himself and his blood paid the wrath of God's penalty that you deserved. It's crucial that you see The first coming of Christ and the death of Christ is the foundation for his second coming. Because without Christ's victorious death at his first coming, our Lord would never return in victory at his second coming. How can you know for certain that Christ will return? Because of his first coming. Because of what he did on the cross and what that accomplished and his resurrection. Because of that, you can know that Christ will come a second time. That's the greatest reality for you. The greatest defining aspect of you, if you're a Christian, is that your sins have been removed and you stand holy before God. He took all of your, Christ took all of your sins and he put all of his righteousness, his perfect obedience on this earth, he put his righteousness on you. So what is the Bible's, New Testament's favorite word for Christian? He calls, it calls you a saint because it's looking at you not through how you acted this past week. You wouldn't be called a saint for that. You were called a saint because of Christ's person and work. And because of that, We can know for certain that he will come a second time. If you don't know Christ, if he hasn't, if you haven't experienced the forgiveness of your sin by coming to him in faith and repentance, then you should not uh, look forward to the second coming. You should not look forward to standing before the holy Christ if your sins have not been dealt with by him, by his grace. Come to Christ if you don't know him. Believe that Jesus Christ is, died on the cross for your sins so that you could be reconciled to him. That's the greatest reality for a believer. What has that done? Look at verse six. And he has made us, believers, made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Salvation is not just what God saves you from. It's also what God saves you to. He saves you to to be a part of his kingdom, a kingdom ultimately of priests. Although we believe there's still a literal messianic kingdom that's coming, even now, Christ's true followers are part of his kingdom. In particular in this passage, it says that you're a a kingdom of priests. That's right, you. The Bible says that you're you're a priest. What's the significance about being a priest in the Old Testament? A priest was someone who had the right to enter into the very presence of God, particularly the high priest. Once a year, Yom Kippur, through the, the blood of the atonement, he could enter into the presence of Christ. Well, the Bible calls you a priest, that you can come boldly before the throne of grace because of what Christ has done. And what's the purpose of all this? What did this all culminate in? Look at the end of verse six. To him, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. The point of all of this is God's glory. The primary point of all this isn't to save you. It's for the glory of God. God deserves all the glory because he is sovereign. He is victorious over this world. John was writing at this time uh, in the midst of an intense persecution. And they could very easily look around and say, God, what is going on? We have an evil emperor. Christians are being killed. 
Right, wrong is said to be right. Right is said to be wrong. What is happening? And yet this clearly indicates at the end of verse six, he has the dominion forever and ever. Our Lord is sovereign over all. Our Lord still reigns supreme as king of kings. Any earthly ruler's authority is given by God, and ultimately, he, God is supreme. Any earthly a, a king or president, their earthly reign ultimately has no lasting significance. But God's does, Christ does. Our Lord Jesus' glory and dominion is eternal. He is completely sovereign. So what are the implications for you from this section? You need to remember that Christ, Christ is the victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ is in charge. Beloved, the more wicked and the more ungodly our world becomes, the more we must remember that Jesus Christ is Lord of lords and King of kings. Otherwise, you're going to struggle in your response. If you aren't convinced very practically that Christ is Lord of lords and King of kings, as you look around, you will tend to give in to frustration, cynicism, even anger, What's happening in our world around us where, where things seem so out of control, but then what's your response? Because your response tells you what you believe about Jesus Christ. In your home, when you talk about the dismaying things that are happening around us, remind one another. Don't let that conversation stop there. Remind one another that Jesus Christ still is on his throne. Christ is still on his throne. He is victorious. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's not surprised. He's not caught off guard. He is sovereign. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. As, as uh, believers... We must often remind ourselves that we are not trusting in earthly government. We are not trusting in earthly politics. We're not trusting in earthly laws. We're not trusting in earthly methods. Our confident hope is in Jesus Christ, the victorious King of kings and Lord of lords. He conquered sin and death and Satan. Nothing else compares. Nothing else compares so that we can have an unshakable hope that's sure, that's certain, that we will be forever with him because he is sovereignly in control. And that should lead you to worship. That should lead you to awe. That should lead you to praise. That should lead you to adoration. And out of that, it leads you to obedience. Because Christ's second coming should energize lives of adoration and obedience. We've seen, first of all, that Christ is coming soon. Secondly, we've just seen that the Christ is coming in victory. And then lastly, we see that Christ is coming in glory. Look at verse 7. Behold. Listen. Pay attention. Behold. He is coming with the clouds. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. How did Christ come the first time? Christ's first coming, he was a, a defenseless baby, born in a, a humble, dirty, out of the way Bethlehem stable. But he will come back in his second coming very differently than that. For his second coming, he will come back as the reigning King of kings and Lord of lords. And this passage indicates that it will be a global phenomenon. We can't practically understand how that works, but it says this in the text. There will be a global phenomenon where every eye will see him in his sovereign might. That's why John says, behold, he is coming in the clouds. Behold, pay attention, be aware. Be ready for his second coming. Titus 2, 11 to 13 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. How? How do you do that? Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. 
You see the connection between those two? How do you deny godliness? How do you deny worldly desires? How do you live sensibly and, and righteously and, and godly in this present age? How do you do it? It's directly connected that you would look for the blessed hope. And the blessed hope is a person. It's Christ and his return. 2 Timothy 4.8 describes Christians as those who love his appearing. They love and they look for anticipation to when Christ will come. So it's central to the Christian gospel. It's central to the, the Christian faith to long for the return of Christ, to long for the second coming of Christ. But what will it be like? What will it be like when Christ returns? We know what it was like his first coming. It's right there written in the Gospels. But what will his second coming be like? Look at verse 7. It says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. How will he come back? He's coming in the clouds. At the beginning of the book of Acts, um, the disciples were confused. Our, Our Lord has just descended into heaven. And angels appear. In verse 10, it says, As they, the disciples, were gazing intently into the sky while he was going, behold, two men, angels, in white clothing stood beside them. They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. He will return the text specifically says how he'll return. But what is the significance of, of Christ returning in the clouds? What is the significance of that? What's it talking about? A cloud was the, the symbol of God's presence uh, with his people in the desert, in the wilderness. So when John says he's, he's coming with the clouds, it doesn't mean that Christ will come gently sailing down on a little white puff of atmosphere. That's not what he's talking about here. This is the blazing glory of Christ. That's what a cloud represented in the Old Testament. This is kind of glory will be surrounding Christ when he returns. His magnificence will be glorious, so glorious that every eye will see him in all his authority, in all his power, in all his glory. He will be the king of kings who is returning in his glory to receive his kingdom, to raise the dead, and to restore all creation so that he can rule and reign. That's why it says there in verse 7, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. Christ's first coming was clothed in obscurity. Absolutely. Very private, very small. No one really knew what was happening. But our Lord's second coming will be glorious for all to see. And who will see him? What does it say? There's, there's two kind of categories of people we see here in, in verse 7. It says they will see him even those who pierced him. Who is that talking about? That's not talking about the uh, Roman soldiers who actually held the spear because you you read in Zechariah, very clear that it's broad and that ultimately it was the Jews who had rejected their Messiah who were behind the piercing of Christ. The Jews will see him. Zechariah 12.10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. So that what? They will look on me whom they have pierced. Talking about the Jewish people. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. And they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Why does Zechariah prophesy that one day the Jews will weep? They will weep because of what they did to their Messiah. There is coming a day that's connected with Christ's second coming when God will save the house of David. He will save the Jews. He will pour out his grace and his supplication on them. He will give them a spirit of repentance, just like he gave you a spirit of repentance. How did you come to Christ? It's not because you decided, well, that's a good thing. I need to trust in Jesus. It's God's sovereign electing work. At the end times, he will do that work to the Jewish people. They will repent. They will plead for forgiveness. Well, who else? What's another category of people there at the end of verse 7? It says, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. 
Well, we know from uh, Revelation 7, 9 that there will be people from every tribe and tongue and nation that will be gathered around the throne of Christ and, and worship of him. But it seems like this is a different kind of mourning, a, a different kind of, than that. Uh, this is probably a mourning over the Lord's judgment on the wicked that will fill the book of Revelation. Revelation 6, 15 and 16 says, Then the kings of the earth, the great men, and the commanders, and the rich, and the strong, and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us. Why? Why do they want the mountains to fall on them? Fall on us. And hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Amazing verse, isn't it? They know. They know who this is. They know the lamb. They know he who sits on the throne, and yet their hearts are so hardened, they refuse to repent. There is a mourning, not a mourning of repentance, but a mourning over the judgment that they are facing. They will not mourn over the Christ they have rejected, but over their doom. So this passage would indicate that, that those who reject Christ, those who reject Christ should be terrified. Then in verse 8, Continuing in our description of Christ, he says, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, saying that, that Jesus was the beginning of all things. Jesus is the end of all things and everything in between. He is sovereign over everything. He was, he is, he is to come. Our Lord is this eternal self-existent I am from eternity past, and he will one day return in power and glory. It says he is the Almighty, the El Shaddai. Or in the Old Testament, our Lord is supreme over all things. Caesar may be ruling the world empire at that time, but John is making it very clear that, that God rules the universe, and he will guide the course of history long after Caesar is dead and gone. In other words, everything in this world finds its significance in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is sovereign over everything in the past. He is sovereign over everything in the present. And he will be sovereign over everything that happens in, this, in the future. And not just of world events, sovereign over the events of your life. Everything. That's the Jesus that is coming back. That's why uh, Christ's second coming should energize lives of adoration and obedience. So what's the point of the book of Revelation as we're looking at this introduction? The point of the book of Revelation is to get us to, to look up from our earthly lives. Our eyes, in a sense, almost have blinders. We're so consumed with the horizontal, with the here and now. The point of the book of Revelation is it causes us to, to look up, to look to Christ, to look to Christ, the sovereign King of kings and Lord of lords who will return, to see the King of glory, to be reminded that we need to look to him, the King of glory, the Christ of glory. I need this reminder. You need this reminder continually. Romans 8, 18, the apostle Paul said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Brothers and sisters, that's the perspective we need. And they were going through a kind of suffering that we can't even imagine. And yet, Paul says there in Romans 8 that compared to the glory that's coming when we see Christ and when he returns, it brings perspective to all of that. What will get you through the suffering and the struggles and the difficulties of your life? What will get you through your own failures and your own sins? What will get you through that? A clear view of the glory of Christ that one day, you will stand before him. Live in light of the day when the king of kings comes back and that will enable you to live today for his glory. In spite of the struggle, in spite of the difficulty, in spite of the distraction, live for that day and it will bring perspective that you and I need for today. Beloved, Christ is coming back. Christ is coming back. Live in light of his soon return. He deserves to have first place, not when you just stand before him on that day. There will be no question there. You'll get it. I'll get it. 
No, he deserves that first place in your life today, in the here and now, in every decision, small and great, that you make, in every attitude that you convey, in every word that you say, Christ deserves to have the first place in the here and now. We have to fight against thinking that anything else in this world can make us happy, truly. That anything else can truly satisfy us. It's not money, it's not beauty, it's not reputation, not sports, it's not hobbies, it's not a home, it's not even good things like a family or relationships or many other things that we try to find satisfaction other than Christ. Only Jesus can satisfy and therefore we must keep him, keep him as the first love of our life. And we need to order everything else around him and that he will return. Order our relationships, order our priorities, order our work, order our worship around the soon return of Christ. Love, we need to renew in our souls a, a, a far greater sense of, of wonder and awe at our Lord Jesus Christ, who the book of Revelation declares will one day come back in power and glory. And all the things that you and I right now at this moment we're trying to understand, Lord, help me to understand that it will be all completely understood when you stand before Christ in his glory. You will get it. We will know. And that's why in the here and now, you need to gaze at him. You need to look at him in his word. That's why he's given this, so that you can see Christ in his glory and live for him in the here and now. One of the most stirring accounts in the history of England is about King Richard I, better known as Richard the Lionhearted, 12th century King of England. And while Richard was away defeating the Muslim forces of Saladin, uh, his kingdom in his absence fell on very hard times. His devious brother John usurped the kingship in Richard's absence, and he misused the realm for his own purposes. The, p- king, the people of England suffered deeply. They longed for the return of their true king. And then Richard came back. He returned. And none dared to stand in his path. His enemies and usurpers were brushed aside. The bells rang in affirmation that the rightful king of England had returned. The people declared, long live the king. But one day, one day soon, a king far greater than Richard will come back and will lay claim to a realm far greater than England or any earthly empire. Those who have rebelled against him will be swept aside into judgment. But those who love him and have bowed their knee to his sovereign rule, and have sought to live for his glory, though imperfectly, they will join in his kingdom, and they will live forever with him in worship and awe and adoration. May Christ's second coming energize in each of us lives of adoration, worship, and obedience today. Let's pray. Talk to the Lord. Consider how much has the reality of Christ's second coming, how much has that been on your heart and mind, and and then what are the ramifications of that and and how you've lived? Ask for Christ's grace to to be able to see him and to have a a far greater anticipation of his second coming, particularly as it relates to specific issues that you're facing, decisions, things that you're being attracted to, distractions. Talk to the Lord. Lord. How will a greater passion for his second coming change the way you live? Christ, we bow before you and each of us acknowledge that in each of our lives there are specific things, uh, attitudes, uh, decisions, distractions that are a direct result of of us not having a, a greater passion and a greater longing of your soon return. 
So I pray by the power of your spirit that you would use these words, you would use a, a picture of yourself that we see here in this book, that we would be drawn to you, that we would long for you. There would be a, almost an aching, an agony that we long for your soon return. And standing before you and delighting in your presence for your glory and our eternal joy. So in your name we pray, amen.